time. So um, thank you everyone. My name is Sarah Bloomfield. Um, I'm a lecturer um, here at the Open University. Um, I'm also uh, uh, play a small part on the organising committee for this uh, conference. So welcome everyone. It's great to have you here. Um, and yeah, we've got three speakers uh, or three papers in this session. Um, and we're starting off here with uh, Nathan Harter in, in his polycentric um, order. So if that's all right with everyone, I'll, I'll kick straight off to Nathan. And, and what we'll do is about 15 minutes um, talking. Um, and then ideally, I suppose at, at about 14 minutes past, I kind of put a chat, a, a, note, a one minute sort of timer in the chat, Nathan, just to say um, that we're getting close. I won't cut you off exactly at 15 minutes if you are, if you've got longer. But um, uh, please do uh, sort of think some questions as we're going along. And, and then I'll get you to raise your hand and, and ask your questions. Uh, when the session started. So uh, uh, thank you very much. And um, over to you, Nathan. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate this. My name is Nathan Harder, and I teach in a program of leadership studies at Christopher Newport University, which is a small public liberal arts university in Virginia in the US. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about something that arose from a book club that we conducted here in uh, during the pandemic, we had some students who were reading the same book and conversations that came out of that led me to develop some thoughts and ideas that might be of use to what everyone else is doing during this presentation. Now, if I were to advance the slides, there we go. All right, so as people in leadership studies have already read about the idea that order emerges out of chaos Margaret Wheatley, 1992, was making this popular as an idea. Stephen Johnson also popularized the idea of emergence. Some people have been trying to develop this within the context of leadership studies specifically, for example, in complex adaptive systems. What I'm hoping to do is to go back in time to get behind some of these ideas to names that are probably not as familiar to some of the presenters uh, in fact, I would suspect that for many of the audience, the longer I participate, the more I suspect that Friedrich Hayek is considered, if anything, alien to a lot of the research that's been done. But I'm going to focus on Michael Polanyi. I think there's something to draw from there that will be of use tied to some of the remarks I've heard. For example, in the first keynote that came from Grace Blakely, and then more recently, the one that just preceded this one from Jamie Woodcock. I think they're talking about similar things to what it is that I'm going to pull from Polanyi, an unexpected resource. Polanyi himself, I don't intend to go into great detail, a fascinating life that he led. Hungarian Jew from a family of very prominent siblings. He himself bounced around a bit after flunking out of the Institute of Technology interested in engineering, was a medical officer in World War I, but got his credentials in physical chemistry. You'll have to bear with me on this. His physical chemistry was the area that he pursued professionally, but he left Hungary due to anti-Semitism and traveled to Germany, which is a little like jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. He was a research chemist for a while there, until he had to flee the Nazis and headed to Great Britain where he landed at Manchester. He established himself in chemistry to such an extent that he became a fellow of the Royal Society and in his later years took an interest in the social sciences. The book that the students read with me, The Logic of Liberty, was based on lectures on economics he was preparing for Chicago. In effect, what he was trying to do was apply many of the things that he had been coming to understand in his own field to economics. Uh, we joked frequently that he may not have been an economist, but he still had provocative ideas. This next screen is too cluttered for me to read. It's simply to give the idea that the man was well-connected with intellectuals of his day, poet, theologian, philosophy, physics, these are some of the people that he interacted with. I grew up not knowing the name Polanyi, but he must have known just about everybody who was anybody. This will tie together to his idea of interdisciplinarity. He himself was interdisciplinary. His son won the Nobel Prize in chemistry 
So he stuck to that particular interest, but he himself branched out frequently. What I'd rather do is focus on some of his ideas. Before I get to that, this is an anecdote that I cherish, and I think it gives a hint as to his viewpoints. He had arguments with a woman poet for hours, as it says here, with great admiration. And one day he attended a talk that she gave. The man behind him said, this woman is mad. And Polanyi leaned back and said in a whisper, that, my good man, is her professional privilege. This gives you an idea about the range of his interests and the idea that we need to be involved in what he called conviviality, interdisciplinary dialogue. He did this himself, and he was a great believer that this needs to be done. I, too, subscribe to that view in leadership studies. And so I'm hoping that this conference will continue that. He also was a believer in something called tacit knowledge. He wrote a book on this, that there is behind whatever it is we're trying to resolve, a whole host of assumptions and understandings which we use when we're trying to understand the one problem that's in front of us. The problem is they're not always conscious. They're not always, uh, we're not always aware where they come from. They could be tradition. They could be from our upbringing. Wherever they come from, they influence how we solve the problem that's in front of us. The thing that he wanted to emphasize in that book was that you can swing the flashlight around back onto whatever that tacit knowledge is. Uh, you'll see here the name Esther Lightcap Meek in a couple of bullet points. She's been developing this in her own work recently in epistemology on the subsidiary focal integration, SFI that it's like swinging a flashlight around and then integrating all of the various things you can see in the flashlight so that they make sense together. This requires freedom of inquiry. Instead of accepting tradition or what you knew in the past and accepting it without criticism, you had to have the freedom to question those things. Otherwise, this process doesn't work. Taking something of a leap, he was one of the champions of spontaneous organization. The word spontaneous is sometimes used to mean abrupt or sudden. That's not how it's used here. It means without authority, without somebody managing, directing the process, it emerges. And we see this word emergence then later in leadership studies. For him, he saw this in the sciences. In fact, his research contained in this book is based to a large extent on his research into the development of science in the Soviet Union. He interviewed, he studied what was going on immediately after the revolution and saw a distinction that bothered him because there the organization was run by the party, not only what you could study, but what the outcome of your research needed to be. It had to serve the people and it had to serve the party. In his opinion, that's not science that violates science and it leads to bad outcomes. It had to come from the scientists themselves, policing each other, answering to one another over time. He alludes to the common law as another example of spontaneous organization. This is something I know a little more about because I was trained to be an attorney, but I'm a huge fan of the common law. As you can imagine, Hayek was more interested in the market economy, but these are three examples of spontaneous organization. The last that I'm going to mention on this slide is the levels of reality. He's an early champion of modeling, and we do this now in leadership with various levels of organizations. At what level do you use which kind of leadership? This will tie into polycentric order because you're going to need different kinds of leadership depending at which level you're operating. So if we had to imagine, and we can do this a variety of ways, these various centers that don't necessarily answer to one another in a unified way, they answer to one another locally, what's in proximate distance, whoever it is that affects your interests that you have uh, grievances with, that you want to get something, all these multiple agents with different degrees of expertise and power are bumping up against one another. Finding accommodation. This is a non-hierarchical structure that emerges out of this, but it also then lends itself to interaction across boundaries. 
in academia, this would be across disciplinary boundaries. It could be two different industries talking to each other. It could be people in two different countries talking to each other. It didn't matter. The boundaries themselves were not necessary to a polycentric organization. Over time then, through these interactions, you would have adjustments. As they make adjustments, he called it successive approximation. Now, the example he used, I think, is fairly mundane, but it works for me. And he talks about trying to fill a sack full of potatoes. You could have somebody design a system to maximize the sack, so we have the most number of potatoes in the sack, or you can put potatoes in there and shake it up. And that will reveal that there's more space. And then you put more potatoes in, shake it, and over time, they will adjust to one another. A very homely example, but the idea that this is how it works in science and law, common law anyway, and in the marketplace was something of a novelty. Such a structure responds to unintended consequences quickly as compared to a centralized authority, which has to recognize the problem, do research, consider different alternate responses, and try to resor bring resources to bear on an entire system. Rather, these little experiments can be done as people adjust to the changing circumstances to accommodate whatever it is that has popped up, the novelty, the changing landscape of their interactions. And then because it's polycentric, they can learn from one another. They can find out that in, over there, they did it this way. We can try that too, or maybe we shouldn't because these are some of the unintended consequences they experienced. Ultimately, you'll have leadership of a conventional kind at one level where you're trying to articulate a vision, motivate people, respond to change over time. Many of the things we've talked about for decades, but he's also addressing the leadership required at a higher level where you create the conditions for creativity and coordination. You don't yourself impose that order. This is a different kind of leadership and it's a what uh, James Kars would call the infinite game, not the finite game of winning and losing, but the infinite game of keeping this going. Now, some people would argue against him out of arguments of altruism. His response to these claims of altruism about the common good or the public good, first of all, he found evidence that this often masks something sinister. You have to remember he fled the Nazis and he studied this early Soviet Union. His position on fanaticism as a problem is addressed in this book, the idea that terminal values could crowd aside instrumental values, that in pursuit of some good, which you claim, you are willing to violate other goods. Uh, you're, what you're going to do is take the process and run roughshod in order to achieve your goals. This is a problem, in his opinion, is a problem in science. You, there are methods you follow, protocols, people like the, uh, review process for getting published. There's uh, the idea that it can be falsified and that this could, in fact, require you to alter your position. If you're rushing to a conclusion without going through these steps, you run the risk of doing it incorrectly. Regardless of your intention, you could have the best intention in the world. Doesn't mean you're going to succeed. This is a part of the reason why he wanted to emphasize that these systems are so complex that no one person can possibly understand or master the system. We have to trust these polycentric orders rather than a centralized order, which is still unable to master the system, but will use power to impose its order anyway. This is a problem for him. So as you have choices, in any kind of context, you have the possibility then of adapting to the situation where you are. In systems thinking, you have this limited perspective. And we're not asking more of you. We're not asking more of anybody, but to work from within this limited perspective. He admitted that there were three critiques of his view on polycentric order. And I wanted to just run through these quickly. First, 
that this tends to privilege private interest over the public good. Second, that it promotes the emergence of an elite over time, since nobody's controlling who is winning and losing. And third, that it's unpredictable. We don't know what this process will yield. His response to these three critiques, I think, is interesting. The first you can imagine, inspired by Adam Smith, is that the pursuit of the public good doesn't guarantee that the public good is served. In his view, like Adam Smith, private interest is maybe a better mechanism for achieving the public good. And so he admits it probably does privilege private interest, but so what? If that still achieves the public good, we can debate that. And I did want to bring up an exception that he mentions here under this one. I think this is fascinating in early 1950s. But one of the exceptions he talks about when you might get away from polycentric order, quote, the spread of a new deadly plague or a sudden deterioration of the climate. This is pretty stunning that he anticipated these as exceptions where maybe a polycentric order is not called for. Anyway, his response to the second critique that it promotes the emergence of an elite. Again, he will shrug and say, of course, wouldn't you rather have an elite constituted by the experts, by the people who are, have a vested interest and have observed the protocols and have a communal interest in fulfilling the purpose of science in one case, law in another, as opposed to an elite that's ignorant, an elite that's outside trying to impose upon the experts goals, objectives that they themselves would never adopt because he would argue you always have an elite. It's not as though you can wish that away. Why not base it on competence and familiarity with the mission? Third, that this is unpredictable. Again, as in response to the other two, he concedes, yes, it's unpredictable. That's because nobody knows the future. We can't know the future. That's what we are adrift. He actually uses the language of being adrift. How can we determine a future if we don't even understand it? We have to get there by stages and steps. So these are some of the critiques that he has. I think you'll see that this idea of a polycentric order is not dissimilar from the idea of grassroots organizing. I think this is a part of what we just heard in the keynote talking about workers in the gig economy organizing in order to create a, another center, another power center in order to adjust from nation to nation and from industry to industry over time and then learning from one another, which technology permits, so that we can come to a better structure over time. I think you would not have expected neoliberalism to be of use, but this is one thing that I think might be worth pursuing. Thank you very much. Very Matt, Nathan. I love the idea of the sack of potatoes shaking up. Um, I've got a bit of echo on my mic. Oh, it stopped now. Um, uh, uh, have we got any questions? I'm waiting for other people to think. I was just um, reflecting as you were speaking, Nathan, or at the start, you said how you had used um, uh, these ideas in the classroom. And I was just wondering what you did with that in the classroom and what you got. You, was it well, undergraduate, postgraduate students and what you were getting to do to do with it, the practical implications of, of, of it? This was a book club that met at, in the evening hours because I have a study group, private study group that meets in my home for conversation. It's not for credit. There aren't homework assignments. And the same group couldn't do so during the pandemic. So we created the book club online. This was an, an excuse to continue the conversation, but have a focal point. So the students who are interdisciplinary and undergraduate with no religious or political uh, requirements, they try to talk about the book in terms of leadership itself. What are the implications? How does this integrate with what you did learn in the classroom? And then we let the conversation go where it wills. So with a break for brownies halfway through. Uh, the idea was to become familiar with another perspective that maybe they weren't getting in the classroom of a kind of leadership at this higher level where instead of having a vision and driving toward that conclusion, as we often talk path goal and so forth, we talk about creating conditions, more like what Heifetz would say with a holding environment, to give an example. 
to illustrate a different kind of leadership. That's brilliant. Thank you, Nathan. I love this idea of that having an interdisciplinary group. Sounds amazing. Um, uh, Dermot, I can see you've got your hand up. Hi, thanks, Nathan. An interesting uh, presentation of Polanyi's work. This really is an invitation for you to develop one of the things you kind of mentioned in the talk. You mentioned that, uh, you know, it's debatable whether or not the public good is smuggling in the private interests. And uh, I got the sense that you'd more to say on that uh, and also potentially on the the critiques uh, of this polycentric order and where your, your your own views lie in that. Yes, I, I, I find this congenial from the common law standpoint because this was my training. So I was immediately receptive to the idea that an institution can be full of tradition, uh, largely reliable, but also adaptable but it's adaptable at the margins. It's adapt It's like there's a, a um, what should we call it, a tissue on the surface of the future, which has to process how does the tradition apply in this case? So that it's incremental. When somebody wants to pass legislation, what they want to do is bypass that product, pro process. Uh, Polanyi allowed for the possibility. There was a legitimate role for legislation, but it's when people want to impose legislation without letting the process work itself out over time on a case-by-case -case basis that you sometimes get monstrosities at law, uh, strange things that then the courts don't know how to respond to. It alters expectations. Uh, a lot of the common law is based on expectation. What is the rule? You change the rules and everybody has to go through another approximation, another adjustment to one another. And this throws everything off, expectations under contract, expectations under tort law. So I was receptive to this idea. I had never thought about it with regard to science. I'd never had background in this and saw this as a, instrumental to the idea of science as a progressive, as a process. I was sympathetic to this in part because I'm a big fan of process. The process matters, the outcomes frequently, while appealing and maybe even inspiring, can also lead you to run roughshod over other values. And I'm a, because I tend to uh, agree with, well, with a number of theorists who are pluralists, there are multiple values at stake, no one of which is allowed to dominate all the others. Process encourages the incorporation of multiple values. So this is where my sympathies tend to be. And I'm hoping that students will process this in their own way to say, is it possible that I'm wrong? Is it possible there are other values I'm missing? This is one of the advantages, I think, is that with using this approach, walking into a situation, you realize that there are other players with their own interests, their own power, who are going to see things differently, their own tacit knowledge. And by using this, you then, I think fallibilism is a powerful tool. You realize you could be wrong and it could be something you're missing. And so you're more likely to consult others or put them in charge, let them run the show. I hope that's responsive. Did that answer your question, Dermot? I guess I want to, to follow up particularly on this question of the private interest and the, the public interest and how, you know, obviously at sometimes the public interest clearly isn't done for the public interest, but likewise, is there is there something also suspicious about the private interest? Right, uh, and, and he does make these exceptions. So he acknowledges that there are occasions when the public interest is so paramount, either urgent or so obvious that you can't trust the process to achieve what you need. He also uses a third example that I didn't mention, which is wartime, that there are occasions when we're sufficiently unified and it's clear what we need to do and we can't afford to wait. I think this was a topic that came up in an earlier session the idea that uh, sometimes time is of the essence. And so is it more appealing to bypass these slower processes? Pursuing private interest with successive approximation is slower. It's, it's incremental. And ordinarily, I'm a fan of that. 
especially when you see the example of people who are pursuing the public interest but either don't mean it or don't understand what that means or have a limited view of what could be in the future. So many people have a vision of what needs to happen, but they don't realize what's possible. And so they want to bring us to a future that's actually more constrained than what we were going to reach anyway. This allows us to keep uh, adapting our vision to the future if we allow people privately to push toward whatever it is they're trying to achieve. I happen to be a fan of that and uh, I'm, I'm willing to I'm willing to accept that as a, an engine of innovation. I don't know whether Dermot have, have any follow up or anybody else has any other questions to ask. Gone quiet. Oh, here we go, John. Um, hi, hi, Nathan. Thank you very much for a very stimulating paper. Um, uh, I'm wondering, have you thought of applying some of this thinking to uh, sort of social protest movements? Because uh, you know, groups like Extinction Rebellion have been uh, really sort of working and experimenting in this in this field uh, now for a couple of years. And I wonder if you've made the connections there. I hadn't done anything formally, but I see connections. For example, it was Jamie Woodcock, I believe was his name of the keynote speaker that we had earlier, who talked about workers organizing that they're creating another center in a polycenter structure. Instead of employers having dominance, this allows for a polycentric structure as well as the transnational. We create the possibilities. So this is what I guess I'm saying in, is not only permitted, but encouraged as a logical implication of what Polanyi is saying, is that we need to not only permit, but encourage these to emerge but also then to contest with one another for resources, public attention, in order to work through the question of how do we accommodate the various movements. Not all the movements are compatible. Not all the movements are going to agree to share resources. What has priority? Climate change, racial equality, women's rights. Trying to sort that out instead of entrusting it to a central authority, encourage them to make their case, empower them to participate, and then let this process of mutual approximation admittedly slowly work itself out. Yeah, I, I think I think um, my, my sort of limited experience from the Extinction Rebellion has been that initially having a series of sort of principles about how we work and what we value and how we re relate to each other has been very helpful uh, and has definitely uh, assisted a kind of expectation for that kind of pluralism and also a number of very kind of simple but also sophisticated practices like you know, how to conduct yourself how to and how to communicate within a meeting with others uh, approval or, or uncertainty or request for more or to slow down or speed up I mean simple things like that 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 practices that embody a kind of communicative presence amongst difference, uh, which I think is very interesting. But I have to say, in, when it really became very uh, difficult uh, uh, to, to make quick strategic adjustments, uh, another matter. Mm. And I have to admit, I'm a fan of dialogue. This is the purpose of my private study group. And so dialogue is compatible with what you were just describing, I think. Uh, if I, Sarah, if I might be permitted another question, or I, I don't want to. <laughs> I'll, I'll carry oh, on. Just one minute, so say yes. <laughs> I was muted, uh, so let's just uh, pretend I said yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's another question I've been thinking about, Nathan. Is um, you know I, I do quite a bit of work with what I might call sort of elites, you know, people drawn from senior positions in business and government and, and not not for profit. Uh, in groups, you know, we're on the notion that they that they can make a difference, and uh, but of course, unlike this, they can afford to pay for my time. And uh, uh, but one of the things that we try to bring, uh, and I'm, I'm quite clear that there's a sort of hypothesis here around, well, we're going to have elites; they better be enlightened, you know. <laughs> and, um, but it's also really clear if you look at the the 
the changes that have really made a difference to people's lives have not come from elites. They've come from protest movements. And in the UK, Citizens UK have uh, really brought about the, the campaign for a living wage. So that people who work should be earning enough money to live on from it. And that did not come, it came as it were, counter to the elite. But, but thinking about how these different, as it were, uh, we may have a sort of polycentric model here where we've got elites and, and uh, citizens organizing and protest groups uh, as a concept of a polycentric processes uh, that through which change happens. You know? So maybe think about responsible leadership and responsibility is a polycentric citizen problem. What I find uh, useful here is Vilfredo Pareto's idea of a circulation of elites, that certain people who are marginalized will bring forward an elite to represent them, to say they speak for me. And that person then can either join the elites or create an alternative elite, but that there will still be in a large scale society, this mm -hmm. population of people who are trusted to speak on their behalf. Yeah. Wish we had a little coffee session afterwards that you could tea shop at. I'm British, so it's the afternoon. A tea session afterwards, you can carry on this conversation. Because I also see Keith's meant uh, put a comment for you, Nathan, um, making comparisons between Popper and Polanyi in the um, uh, chat. So uh, I encourage you to join one of the uh, networking sessions afterwards. But I must now pass on. So thanks ever so much for that for you, Nathan. Uh, really fascinating talk and really sort of uh, eye-opening. So thank you very much.